it's up to you. No, 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 okay. Ladies and gentlemen, um, get settled if you can. I know it's been a really long day, um, but I think we have a very good panel in front of us. Um, if you could settle down, please. My name is Stephen Erlanger. I'm with the New York Times. I would also like to thank Thierry and congratulate him on this 10th anniversary. Though this feels a bit like a wedding cake, but, but we don't have to think about it. Um, this is, to me, as a career journalist, a very important panel. We're here to talk about truth and trust in the digital age. Now, it seems to me truth and trust are questions in any age. They were questions in the medieval period, too. But now we're all so interconnected. We're all so subject to our phones. In a way, we're prisoners of our phones. Um, and our phones tell a great deal about us. One of the things that the internet has clearly done is it's made an enormous amount of knowledge available to everyone and in many different languages. But as Henry Kissinger once said, knowledge is not wisdom. They're two very different things. One can know many, many things, but not understand much at all. And this is the great fear. So I think what we have is a very varied panel with a lot of expertise and a lot of humanity. I'm not going to introduce everyone because you all have your packs and you can look people up yourselves. Um, and we're going to go right to it. I'm also going to try to leave 20 minutes at the end for questions. And we're going to try to be done by 6 o'clock just to kind of rewin some time and get back on schedule. So um, I appreciate your attention. Um, and first speaker we have, quite extraordinarily, is the chief rabbi of France, Chaim Corsia. Chaim, up to you. Go ahead. Merci beaucoup. Uh, C'est un, uh, un défi pour moi de, de parler, surtout devant des personnalités aussi éminentes. Uh, et d'ailleurs, je vais tricher honteusement, puisque comme pour moi, dans, dans une trentaine de minutes, c'est le début du Shabbat, je m'éclipserai afin de ne pas affronter le débat avec vous en particulier, ce qui me libérera de cette contrainte terrible. Pour vous parler d'un sujet qui est euh, éminemment important, c'est qu'est-ce que la vérité Comment définir la vérité Si on considère que la vérité est absolue, alors il ne peut pas y avoir d'évolution du monde. Et pour le partager avec vous, je voudrais vous raconter une histoire que j'ai vécue lorsque j'étais à Castellane, la plus petite sous-préfecture de France, où j'ai euh, assisté à la messe, et le curé, qui était formidable, euh, a expliqué à ses fidèles le passage des évangiles. Vous voyez que je connais les évangiles, je fais donc du benchmark, j'étudie la concurrence aussi. Et donc, les évangiles expliquent que les premiers seront les derniers, les derniers seront les premiers. Les gens avaient, ses fidèles avaient du mal, et le curé leur explique, en se levant, comme je peux le faire maintenant, en disant, écoutez, vous ne comprenez pas ce que c'est, les premiers seront les derniers, vous connaissez la pétanque Et tous les fidèles disent, oui, on connaît la pétanque. Et donc, il leur dit, quand vous jetez la pétanque, vous jetez le cochonnet, alors je ne sais pas si ici au Maroc on peut parler de cochonnet, c'est le petit cochon, mais comme je suis rabbin, je suis aussi impliqué par le truc. Donc vous jetez le petit cochonnet et toutes les boules essayent d'être le plus proche du cochonnet. Et puis il y en a un qui essaye de tirer sur une boule qui est très proche du cochonnet, il essaye de tirer, il tire et il rate la boule, et sa boule elle va très 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 loin. Puis il y en a un autre qui essaie de tirer, il rate la boule mais il tape le cochonnet qui va très 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 loin à côté de la première boule. Globalement, c'est Galilée. Alors maintenant, comment comprendre Galilée avec le cochonnet Ce n'est pas compliqué. Vous avez une vérité. Vous pensez qu'une vérité est la vôtre. C'est la vôtre et vous voulez la partager, vous l'affirmez. Mais vous êtes loin de la vérité acceptée par tout le monde. Vous êtes très loin. Et puis à un moment, les esprits évoluent et la vérité évolue arrive à vous. Donc on voit bien qu'il y a une vérité d'un moment et il y a une vérité d'un autre moment. C'est ce que me disait Stephen hier, en en parlant ou avant-hier en en parlant, la vérité est aussi conditionnée par le moment. Donc on voit bien que s'il y a une vérité à un moment qui change, c'est qu'il n'y a pas une vérité absolue. Et cette idée-là me semble tellement essentielle qu'il y a un texte qui raconte que lorsque le premier qui utilise les médias mondiaux 
le premier de l'histoire, c'est Moïse, puisque sur le mont Sinaï, il reçoit la Torah, les dix commandements, et il y a une sorte de percussion du monde par ses valeurs. Le monde est encore percuté par ses valeurs. Tu aimeras ton prochain comme toi-même, préfère la paix. Ces valeurs qui sont au cœur de nos sociétés. Il y a un midrash, c'est-à-dire un commentaire allégorique qui nous explique que Moïse demande à Dieu que deviendra cette loi. Et Dieu lui dit, tourne-toi. Et Moïse se trouve 1500 ans plus tard à la maison d'études d'un rabbin éminent qui s'appelle Rabbi Akiba et il entend commenter la Bible et il ne comprend rien. Moïse ne comprend rien. Alors il dit à Dieu, mais comment ça a changé tant que ça Il lui écoute bien. Et Moïse entend que lorsqu'il est confronté, lorsque le rabbin Rabbi Akiba est confronté à une question, à ce moment-là, il lui dit « Je le sais de mon maître qu'il le sait parce qu'il l'a appris auprès de Moïse. » C'est-à-dire qu'il lui raconte l'historicité des choses, c'est-à-dire l'historicité de la vérité. Et peut-être que la science, par exemple, a changé entre Galilée et nous, mais c'est parce qu'il y a eu Galilée qu'on peut être là, nous. Donc le principe de la vérité, c'est un chemin qui fonctionne uniquement avec le carburant qui, qui nourrit ce débat ici, c'est le dialogue, c'est l'échange. Et lorsque, dans le Talmud, par exemple, il est là, un rabbin éminent, discute avec Shammai, l'un dit blanc, l'autre dit noir, l'un dit oui, l'autre dit non, l'autre permis et interdit, ils ne sont jamais d'accord, ces deux-là. Jamais. Il y a une voix qui sort du ciel et qui dit la parole de l'un et la parole de l'autre sont la parole du Dieu vivant. C'est-à-dire que la vérité n'est pas dans l'affirmation d'une chose, mais dans une tension éthique entre deux positions qui force à trouver un équilibre. Regardez comment la sagesse populaire l'a traduite. Peu importe la culture, partout nous affirmons qu'il vaut mieux un mauvais arbitrage qu'un bon procès. Pourtant, le procès est censé donner la vérité, la vérité juridique, judiciaire au moins. Eh bien non, on préfère un mauvais arbitrage qui ne va pas nous donner la vérité, qui est coupable, qui est responsable, qui doit payer mais une sorte d'arbitrage qui fait que chacun ne perd pas trop. Finalement, c'est exactement ce qu'on essaie de construire tous les jours. Et la grande question des fake news qui nous harcèlent n'est pas tant de savoir ce qui se diffuse, mais comment on hiérarchise, sans parler de fake news, que les réseaux sociaux ont augmenté. Mais quand vous lisez la presse tous les matins, vous voyez bien que vous lisez le même événement, raconté, on a entendu Renaud tout à l'heure, raconté dans le Figaro, raconté dans Libération, raconté dans... Euh, regardez par exemple la déclaration de Balfour c'est l'anniversaire de la déclaration de Balfour vous lisez hier dans le, dans le Libération c'est une catastrophe, dans le Figaro je crois qu'il n'en parle pas, dans le Monde ça dépendra, on verra bien ce soir euh, bref, chaque journal écoutez mon conseil modeste le meilleur c'est la croix dans la croix au moins vous avez, non, mais vous avez une éthique, une forme de je vous dis, je lis la croix avec attention le parisien mais vous voyez bien, cinq médias sérieux je ne parle pas de, de petits fanzines, de petites de petits sites, non, des médias sérieux traitent la même information avec un angle différent. Finalement, la vérité est probablement la conjugaison de tous ces angles. C'est en fait le dialogue, c'est-à-dire la capacité à s'enrichir de la vérité de l'autre. Et c'est ce qui fait que dans le débat entre les religions, nous devons rendre grâce à la République et à la laïcité que la République porte. Parce que s'il n'y a pas de laïcité, soit il faut un, un, un pays ou un gouvernant ouvert comme peut l'être le Maroc, alors on permet à chacun de vivre sa foi sereinement, soit on garde le modèle républicain, qui est un modèle où l'État est neutre et chacun a la liberté de pratique religieuse. C'est-à-dire, en fait, personne ne dit quelque chose de grave, personne ne dit « j'ai la vérité ». Chaque religion affirme « nous avons notre vérité » et pour que ma vérité puisse s'exprimer, il faut que je me batte pour que la vérité des autres puisse exister. Mais dès que je dis cela, J'affirme qu'il y a plusieurs vérités, et ça sera, à mon avis, tout l'enjeu de votre débat. Ouais. Ouais. Maintenant, voilà. je, me suis gardé, je me suis gardé 12 secondes pour pouvoir, si vous permettez, vous souhaiter à tous Shabbat Shalom. Oui. Shabbat Shalom, bon Shabbat, puisque je m'en vais faire le Shabbat. Okay. Merci. Merci. Shabbat, merci bien, et Shabbat Shalom aussi. Okay. Well, no. okay. um, I think the point I take from this is important, which is that truth is a balance. Um, it's something that emerges from dialogue and discussion. Um, but I'm always remembering 
what I think Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a great American politician and writer, used to say, which is, you can have your own opinions, but you cannot have your own facts. And so when we talk about truth, yes, truth emerges from discussion, but there's some things that simply are true, um, even if Galileo had to die for something he understood later was correct. Anyway, um, we're now going to move to Susan Lioto, um, who does lots of things, but does a, um, has a real specialty in ethics. And I think in this internet age, um, particularly with the scandals swarming around and the way the media is being used for them, I think has quite a lot to say. Susan, please. Uh, and I echo the thanks and congratulations to Che. It's an honor to be here. So what I'd like to try to do is to focus on a couple of themes that I think undergird this link between technology and what we might call truth and indeed trust under siege. Um, and in particular, I'd like to look at this um, intertwining of technology, power, and truth. Uh, and see what it yields in terms of what we should do, because there's a lot of explaining and complaining, but at the end of the day, we need to take action. Um, and I would suggest that we need to rethink the way we're making decisions in this technologically laden world. So to start with, power today, as we've been hearing throughout the day, is scattered. We heard it from the president of the ICRC. We heard it from Ambassador Eisenstadt. Um, power is scattered to people like the WannaCry hackers, or like the extremist Buddhist monk uh, in Myanmar who disregarded the government's prohibition on his preaching uh, and just took to Facebook with his verbal abuse of the Rohingyas and some horrific photographs. Um, the problem with the scattering of power is that there's no corresponding assumption of ethical responsibility for the deployment of the power. Um, and in fact, we don't really even know who has the power. The second power dynamic is a concentration of power in the technology companies. Um, all the time in the news, we hear about the so-called Big Five, the Amazons and Googles and Facebooks. But in fact, it goes much further, and not just to the Ubers of the world, but all the way down the chain to the startups. And the fundamental responsibility issue here is that they typically do not, and there are exceptions, but they typically do not think ethics first uh, and then put their technology out there. In fact, many of them, I would suggest, have a proactive strategy of just doing and waiting until they have a head-on collision with a regulator or consumers who will stop them. Um, and so the question here is, how do we rebalance the allocation of responsibility? And the starting point for me, at least at this point, is to say that this tagline that they're only a platform is simply no longer acceptable. Um, we can't have uh, online sex trafficking, recruiting of terrorists, and all manner of wrongdoing, and have these companies just saying that they are just a neutral platform. Um, on the other hand, we can't have regulators off-targeting uh, and quashing innovation in ways that can also be negative um, for society. Uh, now, the, the final point about power and, and technology is that technology has disempowered state institutions. Uh, starting with a law, we see that legal systems lag very far behind technology, which is constantly changing. Uh, and at, at an increasingly fast pace, and the law simply can't keep up. We see that legal systems are uh, very ill-equipped uh, with the, the cross-border impact of technology, uh, and understandably, legislators just don't understand the technology. Um, and similarly, state institutions are going to be falling short with respect to power, and there are many complicated examples. Uh, I'll stick to one, which is cyber warfare. I don't know of many states who could uh, run a cyber war without uh, recourse to the private sector or indeed individuals. So technology has totally disrupted this um, power dynamic. And the first part of the what we do question is that we need to make decisions in this new reality and not thinking about uh, a balance of power that is outdated, even a year or two outdated. Um, and now truth. Technology has also catalyzed this epidemic of uh, compromised truth. So fake news is, is a major example, uh, but there are other examples out there. There's a Chinese app called Meitu that allows one to take away a few wrinkles and take away a few pounds in a matter of seconds and then put a photo on a dating app. Um, so they're all manner of contagion. Uh, 
Um, but in order to do the right thing, in order to make good decisions, we must insist on truth. The kind of scientifically verifiable or social science research-based truth. Um, and to Stephen's earlier point, I had the privilege of interviewing Salman Rushdie uh, a couple months ago, and he said, you know, it's not because you say the world is round that it's round. The world doesn't need you to believe that it's round for it to be so. Um, and I think we all, again, need to be um, staunchly committed to truth. Uh, more generally, when we put all of these dynamics together, the power and the contagious nature of truth driven by technology, we have to ask ourselves what else about our decision making needs to shift. And I would suggest a couple of things. Um, one is that we need to broaden the conversation. It can't be that the innovators uh, and those who control the innovations uh, be they large corporations or holders of supermajority voting shares in Silicon Valley, they can't be the deciders on behalf of society about when and how innovation is unleashed on society. We need a much broader conversation. Um, I have a personal challenge of trying to figure out how to do this, uh, but it needs to involve academic institutions and think tanks. It needs to involve corporates and nonprofits and governments of all kinds. And above all, it needs to go beyond the US and Western Europe, because all of the impacts of technology are, are different around the world, but they are certainly global. And at the moment, uh, the only sort of checks and balances are institutions like the European Commission um, and largely um, sort of lobbying in America, et cetera. Um, the other thing we need to do with our decision making, in my view, is to look at it through three lenses all focused on humanity. One is the individual. So if we're looking at, for example, gene editing, uh, and incidentally, everything I'm saying applies across any kind of technology, whether it's Bitcoin or civilian space travel or gene editing or social media. But if we take the example of gene editing, a patient with Huntington's disease wants it now, and understandably. But at the same time, if we're looking at it through the societal lens, we're very worried about all of the risks of this, um, what the experts say is a scissor simple technique, and what happens if we lose control of it. And if we look at humanity writ large, we're very concerned about potentially permanently altering the human germline. So all of these questions, though, have potential implications for individuals and for society and for what I would call humanity writ large. Um, and then finally, we need to um, look at this very uh, daunting and complex reality that we have with this complicated distribution of power, uh, lack of understanding about where it is and who's responsible, uh, and we need to avoid taking refuge in the binary. So we seem to be suffering from an epidemic of binary decision making. I'll, as a London resident, I'll call out Brexit as the crowning example of a disastrous decision, the only result of which could have been divisiveness and waste. But there are others. Um, a physical example is President Trump's wall, one side or the other. We have transport for London, Uber, in or out. And I think we should be asking not so much uh, yes or no with these technologies that have both positive and negative, but we should be asking when and under what circumstances. How can we maximize the positive benefits and minimize the risk? So I think I'll start there. Susan, thank you very much. I mean, one thing I just wanted to ask you, what, what always troubles me is, that at least under American law, as I understand it, things like Facebook mm -hmm. are not really publishers. Mm -hmm. They're just, they don't have the obligations of publishers. Um, they're kind of highways mm -hmm. on which all kinds of garbage can pass. And they say, we have no responsibility for what travels on our road. We're just the road, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet, the minute you begin to talk about regulation, mm -hmm. certainly in Western democracies, you begin to have a slightly chilling effect who regulates what, and where does freedom of speech end? And we'll come back to, to this, but I'm just curious to ask you, um, how much is this becoming a restriction on one's sense of the freedom of the internet? I mean, have we had the party and now we're worried about the hangover, or what? Uh, I think it's a great question. I mean, first of all, I should say that all of these companies have a lot of margin for proactive ethical decision making before we ever get to infringement on free speech. Um, and all of this will have to be about effective ethical decision making 
above and beyond the law. Because as I said, the law will never catch up, and we wouldn't want it to, because the law would, un would undoubtedly cross certain lines. Um, but I am very, I should say, I'm very pro-innovation, I'm very pro-business, I'm very pro-free speech, and I don't think ethical decision-making tramples on any of that. Even in the US and in the UK, um, but in particular in the US, even the First Amendment doesn't protect some of the speech that I'm talking about. It doesn't protect uh, inciting murder. It doesn't protect certain kinds of hate speech. It certainly doesn't protect child pornography and online sex trafficking. Yeah. And as the Supreme Court once said, free speech does not include shouting fire in a crowded theater. Right. Right. Okay. Um, next, we have Oliver Busman. Now, here we've been talking about the some of the ethics and the issues around the technology, trust and truth. Um, Oliver is going to explain to us that the real technology, and I think he has things that we can learn from. So Oliver, please. Yeah. Stephen, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Yeah, it's exactly what Susan said. You know, we are coming out of 20 years of um, Facebook, Google dominating uh, communication channels and uh, content, and there's a lack of um, oversight and making sure that uh, uh, can we trust these kind of sources of information. And I want to walk you through something. It sounds a little bit technical, I would say, but um, I want to use some animation to walk you through something that I believe is the next wave of um, internet that we've been through 20 years ago. And uh, it's called blockchain, and uh, I would say it's the new technology of trust because it will change how we interact between each other, how we transact, because it's uh, leveraging the open internet, it's leveraging cryptographic functionality, and you will see a lot of things will get faster, more secure, especially it comes to key information and also to establish a new way of uh, trust. So something that for tw uh, 20 years ago, we swing more to a central model, we will see, we'll swing to a totally different model. And uh, let me explain that in a, in a small animation that um, I think we are uh, at the beginning of a major change. If you look at um, the way today we, how we um, interact is um, we transfer over the internet um, information by duplication. We always copy music, uh, um, PDFs, PowerPoint, whatever, if you want to exchange this between uh, two parties. So there's a lot of uh, duplication, and there's, in most of the cases, somebody that verifies that this uh, is being processed in the right way, and that, is, that generates a lot of complexity. Complexity that all the parties have to reconcile their positions, they have to maintain their own books, I would say, and they have to be always in, uh, in sync. And that's something, especially in the financial service industry, if you look, if you buy and sell trades uh, or stocks, it takes few days, there are a lot of parties involved, and um, it takes time, and it's intransparent. And then now with the blockchain, uh, what's the desire is that um, we're moving now in a world that physical assets can be transferred. That means we don't want to uh, have a duplication of assets, whatever is out there. We don't want to use a third party. Uh, it's almost like a self-regulated way to uh, exchange doing a deal, doing a transaction, exchanging information. And so, so the blockchain technology at the end is, um, it's something uh, between two parties now. It's very direct peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, the information that you store on the open internet cannot be uh, changed, it's immutable. Um, and is happening without a third party. So it eliminates potentially maybe a Facebook, a Uber, um, playing houses, other third parties that usually between uh, two parties are involved. Because the, 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 the key point, if you look, what is a blockchain? Um, I think you can describe this in four topics. One is everything is digital, there's no paperwork anymore, um, everything will be stored in a way. And the difference is that the network, that means you and I and, and other parties will verified in an automatic way those transactions by consensus. So it's a, it's a very decentralized way. And I will have an example in a minute about the media industry that, um, yeah, the community at the end will make sure that those news are the right ones and also fat, um, fast checks, et cetera. 
and it's secure. So you cannot add, move, change this information. If it's out there, it's verified. It's, it's, uh, it's secured through cryptographic uh, functionality. So it's a completely different way how we interact going forward. And it means, um, um, uh, but what's the difference is at the end, the middleman, uh, it can be a buyer and a seller, it can be an eBay that will disappear. Uh, there will be um, a direct relationship between an investor and a company, somebody want to invest. And that's for me uh, the real example right now in the industry because um, um, uh, the venture capital industry is getting diminished by this because there's a new technology out there with the blockchain that uh, companies can sell their virtual stocks through the blockchain technology and it's getting more funding right now than called initial coin offerings than the venture capital industry. So venture capital easy as a middle person is already in, uh, under pressure. Uh, the same also between reader and producer, uh, the middleman uh, exchanging this information will disappear. And this is a serious business because they are, it's very comparable with what happened 20 years ago. We're talking about 2,000 uh, startups working in all industries, financial service industry, media, um, logistic, healthcare, building up these new solutions. And if you look at how much money already is invested, very similar then to the internet startup companies 20 years ago, 500 million per year. But that number that was the last year was 700 million invested in blockchain startup. This year will be over 3 billion. Because with the technology, there is now access to capital uh, that was not in place before. So we see a democratization of access to capital that usually we saw bottlenecks to private equity firms and venture capital firms will be free up. So there's something that um, I want to put you on here or put this on the radar screen of you because this has an impact on geography, on region, on business development. Let me walk you through one example. I'm not talking about financial service industry because the financial services banking is the fast mover. I would say very close to that is the media industry. And, and Susan mentioned that you know, we run into an issue, there's some content being produced out there and nobody can verify is it, is it, is it real, is it, is it fake, et cetera. So there's a company out there and there are many, many other uh, decentralized um, startups out there that are putting now news networks out there called decentralized news networks. That is a platform for a producer, writers, uh, reviewers and readers. That means uh, the, the producer provide content. There is a community of um, fast check uh, reviewer. And, and the, the community is then also, they get paid for that, uh, provides based on guidelines, is this information correct? And uh, provides this information to then to the community. And there's an incentive for that because everybody gets uh, through certain cryptocurrency gets paid for that. So there is a way also to um, increase the adoption for that. So there's collaboration that's decentralized, and there's a factual way also to put information out there. So something that's really fascinating to watch, I think the adoption of those kind of technology will be faster than I would say a Facebook. It took them over three years to get to 50 million. I think this will be faster because there is a monetary effect that the user get instead of uh, a company like Facebook through commercials. And this can be applied for all, in, all industry like financial services, logistic, healthcare, um, and other industry. At the end, we're talking about um, significant benefits from perspective, exactly, we're talking about simplification, we're talking about simple uh, speed, transparency from point of view. So the technology itself, at the end, it's a new technology of trust that uh, the community will enable, and there is a momentum uh, across the region that I think is unstoppable. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I must say, I still feel a chill. Um, I suspect the tax man also feels a chill, because if there's no record, then there's no tax. The there is a record because everything will be a record on the internet. So the traceability of those transactions is even higher from an AML anti-money modern perspective, from, a, from that perspective. You see, um, um, and it's a global theme. It's not limited to certain countries, et cetera. It will be cross-border accessible. That's great, thank you. I mean, what I'm hoping is 
when we get time to questions, I mean, people in the audience will, will have specific things to ask. Um, the whole idea of decentralized media um, fascinates me, partly because it seems to eliminate the whole idea of professionalism, of professional editors, of training, of craft. You know, if, if everything is a hobby, um, then who do you trust? So you, you, could, you could, professional editor could get incentivized to be part of the review yeah. network because they get paid through that. Yeah. Right? So that's a different role well, that the, the editor could play yeah. in the future. Well, as, as a former editor, I'd probably make more money with your blockchain Abs than I do. Absolutely, I would say, because I think you <laughs> have much bigger access to information that can be verified. No? Anyway, thank you. So, um, but there are lots of legal issues that come up about the um, digital world, about how news is done, about how um, people's information is followed. I mean, and um, we're lucky, I think, to have Antida uh, Noradam here, um, who is a professor of public law and works on these issues, and elle parlera en français. Merci. Je vais mettre debout okay. pour um, normalement la présentation est censée euh, arriver. Euh, je voulais tout d'abord évidemment remercier Thierry de Montbrial euh, de m'avoir invité à participer à cette conférence. C'est un honneur pour moi de faire partie de, de ce panel. Alors, je, euh, en préparant cette interview, euh, cette, cette intervention, pardon, je me suis étonnée du fait que finalement, euh, je n'étais pas particulièrement affectée par les fake news ou les théories relatives à la post-vérité parce que je dois vous avouer que je n'utilise pas les réseaux sociaux. Euh, paradoxal, évidemment, pour quelqu'un qui travaille sur le, le numérique. J'espère que je n'ai pas perdu toute crédibilité. Euh, néanmoins, je n'utilise pas les réseaux sociaux parce que je n'ai pas confiance dans les réseaux sociaux. Et là, je suis bien dans le thème de, de notre panel. Euh, cependant, ce n'est pas le cas de 51% des citoyens américains, si on prend cet exemple, qui, selon un rapport de l'agence Reuters de 2017, s'informent uniquement par les réseaux sociaux. Le fait que je ne me sente pas directement concernée par ce phénomène ne signifie pas que je ne m'intéresse pas à ce phénomène, heureusement, et ma contribution sera donc de montrer les aspects juridiques de la question. Alors, plutôt, plusieurs questions se posent ici sur, euh, finalement, euh, le droit existant. Est-ce que le droit existant est suffisant Est-ce qu'il faut créer de nouvelles règles pour encadrer ce nouveau phénomène Comment préserver l'équilibre entre réglementation des fake news, protection de la liberté d'expression, protection de la liberté d'information Il existe différentes manières pour le droit de réagir à un phénomène nouveau, il doit d'abord tenter de le qualifier par rapport aux règles existantes, aux catégories existantes, rechercher éventuellement qui sanctionner, et si les solutions ne sont pas suffisantes, voir éventuellement quelles sont les causes du phénomène, en se posant toujours la question de la forme que devront prendre ces solutions juridiques. Ce sont donc les quatre points que je vais présenter ici devant vous. Premier, euh, premier point, peut-on qualifier juridiquement les fake news Alors la première opération à laquelle euh, euh, procède un juriste lorsqu'il est confronté à un phénomène, c'est de considérer les faits et de tenter de les qualifier juridiquement, c'est-à-dire de faire entrer les faits dans des catégories juridiques existantes. Cette euh, opération de qualification va permettre de définir le régime juridique euh, correspondant. Alors, ce qui caractérise les fake news, ce sont euh, notamment euh, le, enfin, c'est le mensonge euh, et euh, le droit. Alors, il faudrait pouvoir qualifier ce, ce mensonge. Le droit ne sanctionne pas le mensonge en tant que tel, mais peut le faire en fonction du contexte ou en, euh, con, enfin, en ajoutant certains éléments euh, à ce mensonge. Alors, plusieurs qualifications existent en droit français ou en droit de l'Union européenne qui pourraient être utilisées euh, pour qualifier le phénomène des euh, fake news. Je vous ai donné quelques exemples. Euh, le délit de fausse nouvelle. Le délit de fausse nouvelle, c'est euh, le fait de diffuser des informations fausses ou mensongère, et donc ce délit existe en droit français, il est pénalement sanctionné, il est certes peu utilisé, mais pourrait tout à fait être ravivé dans ce nouveau contexte. 
l'action en diffamation également, ou euh, le droit à la réputation en ligne, l'irréputation, qui euh, est mentionné dans le nouveau règlement euh, européen sur la protection des données personnelles, est une adaptation de la diffamation dans le contexte euh, numérique. On a aussi des anciennes institutions comme le droit à la vie privée, les atteintes aux intérêts fondamentaux de la nation ou encore la publicité trompeuse qui pourraient être mobilisées pour qualifier le phénomène des fake news. On voit donc que le droit existant peut encadrer ce phénomène et pourtant certains considèrent qu'il est insuffisant, qu'il est lacunaire, notamment parce qu'il ne serait pas à même de sanctionner tous les participants au phénomène des fake news en raison de l'ampleur finalement de ce phénomène. Alors qui sanctionner je vois finalement euh, deux types d'auteurs. De, de, tout d'abord, euh, l'opérateur de plateforme en ligne, dont vous parliez euh, tout à l'heure. La plateforme numérique désigne de nombreux acteurs euh, du numérique. Ça peut être le moteur de recherche, euh, les réseaux sociaux, la plateforme de vente. Donc c'est une définition euh, très, très large. Et le choix de la qualification ici sera euh, importante pour définir les obligations de ces plateformes numériques et le régime de responsabilité qui sera applicable. Alors là aussi, plusieurs exemples. Si on considère que la plateforme en ligne est un simple hébergeur, euh, au sens des directives européennes, dans ce cas-là, on pourra dire que cette plateforme en ligne n'a qu'une responsabilité allégée parce que les, les hébergeurs sont censés être neutres, avoir un comportement technique, automatique, passif qui justifie un allègement du régime de responsabilité. De la même manière, si on les considère comme des prestataires techniques uniquement, ils n'auront pas d'obligation générale de surveillance des contenus, même si les États peuvent exiger de leur part un certain nombre de précautions à l'égard des contenus qui sont diffusés. En revanche, si on qualifie les plateformes en ligne de responsables de traitement des données, comme cela a été fait par, pour Google, par exemple, comme moteur de recherche par la Cour de justice de l'Union européenne, alors il faudra leur attribuer un certain nombre d'obligations, de loyauté, de transparence, voire une obligation de déréférencement, euh, par exemple. Même chose si on considère que les plateformes en ligne sont des fournisseurs de contenu, c'est-à-dire des auteurs, des éditeurs, là aussi, une responsabilité renforcée sera exigée, une responsabilité éditoriale. Donc la question qui se pose, c'est comment qualifier ces plateformes numériques Est-ce qu'on peut dire que ce sont des éditeurs ou simplement des opérateurs techniques Le problème d'attribuer le contrôle du contenu à ces opérateurs privés, c'est que finalement, on va avoir un contrôle de l'ordre public numérique par des acteurs privés, ce qui nous amène à réfléchir aussi à la notion de souveraineté à l'ère numérique. Les les auteurs qui peuvent également être sanctionnés, ce sont les auteurs même de ces fausses informations euh, et qui euh, obligent à penser à une responsabilisation euh, de ces auteurs. Sauf que ce système de responsabilisation pose plusieurs problèmes. D'abord, la question de l'anonymat. Comment identifier les auteurs des fausses informations Ce n'est pas toujours euh, évident. Et ensuite, deux problèmes juridiques. Comment définir le statut de ces auteurs, euh, différencier l'auteur lambda d'un auteur journaliste, par exemple, qui n'ont pas les mêmes euh, obligations, ne sont pas soumis au même régime, et un deuxième problème qui est celui de l'extraterritorialité du droit, c'est-à-dire quel droit appliquer lorsque, euh, finalement, ce qui caractérise Internet est à la fois l'ubiquité et l'immédiateté. Alors, on, là aussi, on voit que le droit a des solutions à proposer qui, euh, pourtant, ne semblent pas suffisamment satisfaisantes euh, pour euh, certains. Donc on pourrait essayer de s'attaquer aux causes du phénomène, et j'en vois deux, les gains financiers qui, euh, que rapportent finalement euh, les fake news, et euh, la défiance, une cause plus profonde, la défiance vis-à-vis -vis des institutions et de la classe euh, dirigeante. Alors comment le droit peut-il lutter contre ces gains financiers Il faudrait s'attaquer au modèle économique de la gratuité qui finalement fonde une grande partie du système d'Internet. Et il n'est pas sûr que le fait de faire payer l'information garantisse une plus grande confiance dans les médias. 
La défiance aussi vis-à-vis -vis de la classe dirigeante, alors la restauration de la confiance peut se faire par la sanction évidemment des responsables, par une protection effective des victimes et aussi par de nouveaux instruments juridiques. Et j'en viens à mon dernier point, comment réglementer au mieux ce phénomène deux solutions, soit on adopte des instruments juridiques non, non contraignants, la co-régulation, l'autorégulation avec les acteurs privés, ou sinon un instrument juridique contraignant. La question qui se pose aujourd'hui est de savoir si nous avons besoin d'une nouvelle convention internationale sur le numérique, qui me semble a priori être difficile à élaborer. En conclusion, euh, deux remarques. Tout d'abord, il me semble qu'il faut être absolument prudent sur, euh, quant à la volonté de créer à tout prix de nouvelles règles pour encadrer un nouveau euh, phénomène technologique. Et surtout, les nouvelles propositions qui sont faites sont intéressantes, mais elles reposent sur l'idée que les fake news constituent un phénomène d'une nature nouvelle en raison de leur environnement euh, technologique. Il me semble au contraire qu'il s'agit d'un changement plutôt de degré que de nature, et donc, dans ce cas-là, le droit existant est certainement, en partie, tout à fait suffisant. Je vous remercie. C'était excellent. Merci, Antilda. I have one question for you, if I may. And maybe it's a naive question, but is there a complication or a difference between the Napoleonic Code and the common law on these issues? Or are these issues so global that no one's come to grips with this kind of issue? If, if you allow me, I'm, I prefer speaking in French no, to, no. to be more precise. Well, exactly. um, je pense que uh, il y a à la fois des, uh, des, uh, des questions communes à tous les États. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle on a des instances de négociation à l'échelle internationale, par exemple sur les cyberattaques dans le cadre du GIGE, des Nations Unies. Et en même temps, on voit un mouvement de la part des États qui consiste, chacun de leur côté, à essayer finalement de gérer pour eux-mêmes les activités numériques. Euh, et c'est euh, tout l'enjeu que je soulignais tout à l'heure sur euh, la souveraineté à l'ère numérique. Cette, cette idée que les États essayent de protéger leurs droits, protéger leurs valeurs, en justifiant l'application de leurs droits nationaux à ces activités euh, numériques. Sachant que ces activités numériques sont essentiellement le fait d'entreprises américaines qui justifieraient l'application d'un droit euh, essentiellement américain. Sometimes I fear that governments are more worried about protecting their values um, and protecting their powers than they are protecting their citizens. But, well, but we'll see. To, um, uh, okay, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. I'm about to lose my last panelist. Uh, now, what we have to conclude, I think, is quite interesting because it's a test case in these problems. Um, Stefan Human has done, uh, runs an NGO that has, um, looks into the issue of fake news and has done a, a lot of work in um, the last German election and the way uh, news was manipulated or not manipulated and the impact that it had. So it brings us down, I think, to a, a very good real case of the issues we're talking about. Stefan. Thank you, Stephen, and <clears throat> I'm honored uh, to have the opportunity to um, speak to you here at the World Policy Conference. And I think it's, it's a really timely topic. Many of you might have on the way um, over to uh, Marrakesh picked up um, the latest issue of The Economist, and their cover story um, actually asks, is social media undermining democracy? And this is... Um, really remarkable how our discourse, um, our discussion about the internet has really changed in the past years. Um, I want to start um, with a quote um, from Hillary Clinton um, when she was still um, your Secretary of State, and she said, the internet has become um, the public space of the 21st century, the world's town square, classroom, marketplace, coffee house, and nightclub. We all shape and are shaped um, by what happens there, all two billion of us and counting. 
she said that in May 2011 and really captured a very optimistic mood about the internet at that time. It was a place where people could, or the place was seen as a place where people can globally connect, um, where they can share ideas, and where they can actually shape the world um, for better. And now fast forward to the end of 2016, and Hillary Clinton coming um, um, from an upset uh, defeat in the US presidential election, and she um, calls, you know, the internet has become for her a space where there's a fake news epidemic um, with real world consequences, and for, for her, of course, the real world consequences mean that she's not president. Um, she lost the, the presidential um, election. But the fake news discussion is not just about the United States, and, and the consequences are real, and they can be seen um, around the globe, and so I think it's a, it's a really good uh, topic um, for a World Policy Conference. You know, we had uh, um, Brexit, of course, and in the um, course of the Brexit campaign, lots of fake news like this one um, were shared uh, and uh, spread. Um, we have uh, uh, the, the latest um, stories, the New York Times covered this. This is from The Guardian, um, mentioning that in Myanmar, fake images and also fake news are used um, to instigate um, um, violence uh, against the Rohingya um, Muslim minority. Then also a topic we, uh, we talked about this morning um, at the conference, um, the, the independence vote in Catalonia, and also in the context of um, um, the Catalonian discussion, um, there was lots of spread of, of fake news, a lot of um, fake news, for example, about um, fake incidents of um, police brutality. I mean, there was some, um, some incidents with the police, but also lots of made-up stories um, that were shared um, widely um, on the internet. So, um, not, so uh, we, we have heard the term a lot. I think it's, it's, it's important um, uh, to take a moment and, and reflect what this term actually means, fake news. Because um, we have found, uh, when, when, when we looked further into it, that the term is widely used. And on the left, um, you see um, fake news has become a political term. It's, it's been used by, by most, most prominently probably by President Trump to discredit um, the mainstream media and calling that media fake news. Um, often we make up news in terms as, as forms of satire. I mean, we, we're not con that concerned about that. In the middle, you see that fake news can just be, result from poor journalism. Journalists make mistakes. Media organizations make mistakes. Editors make mistakes. Um, that can uh, result in fake news, but usually they get um, quickly corrected. But what we're really concerned is more on the, on the right side, what, what is um, underlined in red, which is um, intentionally, um, um, intentionally spread false information, usually um, a story that's taken out of context, that's intentionally misinterpreted um, to give it a, a different spin and to drive an agenda. And that's really when you look at all these cases that I've cited, if you look at the US presidential campaign, if you look at the Brexit campaign, if you look at Catalonia, you'll actually find that spreading fake news are not just incidents on the internet, they're usually part of campaigns. Um, they are a strategy for political mobilization um, in all of these cases. And I would argue here that we should understand really the problem of fake news as they are being used as a strategy um, for political mobilization. And uh, you can uh, rightly ask, and we should rightly ask ourselves, what's actually new about this? What's actually new about fake news? And here's an example from medieval Europe spreading fake news. Um, this is uh, uh, fake news about uh, Jews killing Christian babies um, and uh, blood libel. And this is an image that depicts that that was used to incite, uh, incite violence and pogroms against Jewish people. So fake news uh, uh, have been around um, throughout history. So what's really new about them? And this brings us, um, of course, to what we have been talking about here at the, at the panel today, the internet revolution, the digital revolution, the spread of the internet, and the spread of social media have given all of us here the ability to produce news and to share them, to distribute them. Two functions that used to be held by um, radio, television, print, that used to be the traditional gatekeepers of how news and information um, is um, created and distributed. Uh, distributed. And these media organizations have lost this 
central gatekeeping function. Now everyone who is connected to the internet, um, who has the ability to use Facebook, who has a smartphone to take pictures, can create stories and can share them um, on the internet and can also distribute new stories to um, friends and networks. That's what, uh, what's really new. And at the same time, we see that the established media is um, in a crisis, not only in a crisis of revenue, as, as Stephen earlier mentioned, with, with declining revenue, but also um, that there's a lot of distrust uh, in um, established news media around the world. Um, we can see that um, it's not the same everywhere. Um, so uh, some countries, there's still much more trust in news media. In Germany, I will show you this in another slide next, uh, it's still quite high. There are other countries um, where it's much lower. Um, this is also a problem in the US where the, the high penetration of social media, so lots of use of social media combined with the distrust in the established um, media system has really led um, to the fake news um, um, problem and, and proliferation um, of fake news. So let's take a look at Germany. Also in, 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 in Germany, um, and this is um, coming now from our own data, this is from a survey um, we did right after the German election. And um, what we've seen here is that in Germany, uh, there is distrust in the media, but there's this particularly a group that has very high distrust uh, in media in Germany, and those are the AfD voters. AfD is the alternative for Germany. It's this new party, um, staunchly anti-immigrant, and that uh, had an upset uh, um, surprise success in the German election, getting more than 12% of the national vote, getting into parliament. And you will see that um, they have very high numbers among uh, AfD voters who um, distrust media, and they are also the group um, that is most likely to believe fake news, and that is most active in sharing, uh, in sharing fake news. And we would therefore also argue that in Germany, fake news were um, mostly uh, used in the, in the context of the, um, um, of the election campaign as a political strategy to mobilize AfD voters. And um, you will probably ask yourselves what, and we are asking ourselves also about, you know, what, what should we do about it? Do we need uh, regulation? Um, what's the, the responsibilities, the ethical responsibility, uh, responsibilities of the social media companies? I will end with um, um, three things that are based from, uh, from our data that, um, that we can explore more in the discussion. Um, the red line uh, or the red um, um, uh, um, column um, shows you um, uh, the engagement um, with fake news and the green one, this is a specific case I won't get into into Germany, the green one is the engagement of the debunking news. So news that corrected the story. And what, we've, what you find consistently as lots of uh, media entities now try to correct news, debunk fake news, is that um, the effect is not as big as um, the initial fake news stories. Fake news get much more attention and there's much more engagement with fake news on, on, on social media platforms. That's the first thing. Um, the, second, uh, the second thing is that a lot of fake news result from poor, what I would call poor journalism or poor press releases that are ambiguous and that are, then are turned into fake news. So here's another story that came up in the context of the German election campaign where there was an incident where bottles were thrown at the German police and the initial um, press release um, talked about a gathering of 1,000 young people and they were thrown, bottles were thrown at the police. Then a media report made, turned these 1,000 young people into 1,000 rioters uh, and um, then fake news stories appeared that were talking about 1,000 young migrant rioters that were throwing bottles um, at the police. And you can see um, that's what we see consistently is when there's ambiguous reporting, if there's, um, um, if there's a poor reporting on, uh, or a poor press release, um, that this is often taken advantage of to, to put a new spin on it and, and, um, uh, and use that uh, spin for a political purpose. Here, again, um, to uh, put blame against um, migrants. And finally, what we see, what really doesn't work that well, and our, our data shows this too, is the fabrication of news, if you completely make stuff up. And the most um, uh, effective way to stop that is if organizations immediately put out um, a counter um, narrative on social media. So if, for this was a fake news story that um, apparently a, a German um, minister in a, in a big German state had said, 
the police should um, not talk about um, migrant um, um, criminality, that, that they should suppress this issue. And um, when this news appeared, immediately um, the, the, his, uh, his office put out a statement that, that he never said that, that this is not true, that this is fake, and you see that his actually debunking story was very widely shared and let that the, the, the fake news story was completely ineffective. So it's also really important that we very quickly react um, when um, fake news stories um, come up. And I, I would like uh, to end it here. Uh, thank you for your attention. Stefan, thank you very, very much. Um, that was great. While you think of your questions, we have about 20 minutes left. I've tried to leave 20 minutes for questions before we go back to the panel. I must say, you, you know, we all have fact checkers. We have teams of fact checkers. Every time Donald Trump issues a tweet or makes a speech or says something, we have fact checkers saying this is right, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. It seems to make no difference at all, right? Because people seem to get their news in silos. And if you believe Trump, you believe him. And if you don't believe Trump, anything he says has to be wrong. Um, and um, this is, it's the nature of our divided politics in America. We see it in Britain also. We see it lots of places. But um, there's no question that fake news, real fake news, as opposed to the kind we're supposed to be putting out, can make things worse. And it seems quite clear that uh, Russian hackers, groups, were trying very hard to touch on polarizing issues in America before the election to create unease and unrest. Um, and, and this was, I think, one of the most fascinating aspects of the whole meddling in the American election campaign. Did it make a difference? Hard to know. Did it change the election? I doubt it. But maybe it served as a kind of antibody for future elections, we'll have to see. So we're open to questions. All I would ask you to do is identify yourself. If possible, please ask a question as opposed to give a speech. That would be really appreciated. Um, so ma'am, first here, is there, great. And then this gentleman over here, please go ahead. And then this lady behind. Good evening, everyone. I am Amanda Mate from South Africa. I run a digital media agency. I have a couple of questions, Please. but I'll stick to three key ones. Um, to start off with, Stefan, your stats, are they not a representative of the cultural understanding of knowledge within the German community? Um, I asked this in the context of South Africa, where we've noted that Content that is usually negative is what spears the purchasing of newspapers in our, in our country. And it's what's driven a lot of our purchasing power in the print space as well as digital. So just to understand, is, it, is there no right. um, reference to that? Then, in the context of digital and social media, and I play in the social media space, how, from your expert advice, do we make provision and in the inclusion of citizen journalism um, where we're looking at a lot of the fake news that are coming through that are actually citizen-based journalists. I say journalists in, in inverted commas, mm -hmm. not really journalists, but people that are normal. We know from the statistics that are released through the Facebooks and the Twitters that a mother will trust the advice of another mother, a product mm -hmm. supported by another mother. Right. How then are we not then breaking that barrier down? And then lastly, in the discussion about legalizations and regulations, uh, I have a few issues about that, but it's debatable. At what point do we bring in the startups um, into that conversation, particularly about how we regulate the meters that are brought out? Mm -hmm. It seems to me it's like a barrier of entry for startups when we already have legal IT um, matters. Great questions. Thank you. This gentleman, please identify yourself. <coughs> Laurent Cohen Tanuji. Right. Uh, I, uh, I guess I'm afraid it's more. Uh, a reaction than a question, but I can put it in a question form. I mean, I'm coming back on the legal discussion we, or presentation we had, I, I don't see why, I mean, when we talk about fake news that really have an impact on, on politics and democracy and pot potentially on the election, when you think that Donald Trump was elected with just 75,000 votes in three states, you can assume right. that maybe 
the Russian interference had some impact at this with such a small margin. So if you compare with <coughs> the financial markets where, where the dissemination of false information is very severely <coughs> sanctioned criminally, uh, I don't see why intentional fake news in the sense of manipulation right. should not be right. also criminally sanctioned. Right. Then the question is, where, where do you hit? And there, you know, I, I recognize the difficulties, but if you take, make an analogy with, with corruption, the fight against corruption, the OECD Convention Against Corruption decided to hit where it's um, maybe the easiest, maybe it's not fair, it's hard to target corrupt foreign officials, but you can hit companies that corrupt them e faster and so, or more easily. Right. And so I would, with this analogy, I think the social networks are easier to target. They've got <coughs> plenty of money. They can either do more effort in monitoring the content, and if not, they should be heavily sanctioned. Thank you. And well, last point, okay. I think the US is in better position to do this, and maybe that's what's happening now in Congress. But if not, other countries can do some of it. The European Court of Justice had the right to be forgotten, and that had a sort of a global impact. So I think things can be done. Merci. Thank you. Um, this lady here, and then, and then a mayor, please. Yeah, my, my question is, first um, of all... Can you identify yourself, uh, do you mind? Sorry. Yes. Carrie Halfordy Hardy. I'm a... My question is, uh, based on what you're saying here, who should be the arbiter? Because we're talking about citizen-based journalism as, as uh, the lady over here talked about. But then you have the question, for example, that was brought up at a recent conference with Baltic uh, ambassadors, mm -hmm. where there was deliberate uh, misinformation being planted by state organisms. So it's not merely a question of what's coming out on social media, but it's also what's coming out in state-sponsored organisms. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is something where you can't simply say that the arbiter should be a state-appointed regulator. And so if you could speak to that, I'd be great. great. Thank you. That's a very good question, having looked a lot at RT, for instance. I'm Mir Shitrit from Israel. Yeah. A few years ago, I talked in this conference about the cyber. And uh, I would like to know what you think about the cyber in this, uh, in this subject that we're speaking about, because the cyber became to be much more stronger than ever before. And it is developing very, very strongly. And of course, it has a very big influence about the possibility of creating a fake news, because by cyber, you can get immediately into almost every, uh, every site of every, of every campaign and everything and see everything in it. That's what happened in the United States, for example. I would like to hear your relation about these uh, cyber attacks. Thank you. There are a couple, at least one or two hands way in the back. Or maybe it Thank was. I, I had a friend helping me That's amplify what I the thought. reach. <laughs> okay. Uh, my question is for you, Susan. Uh, sorry, just identify yourself. Sorry. My name's Natalie Cartwright. I am one of the people who runs a startup. I have an uh, AI startup that works directly with banks. And the reason why I'm at this conference is we're relatively early stage. We're about Series A. But because of our channel partners with banks, my product will be in the hands of tens of millions of people over the next couple of years. Um, I'm really interested in having an ethical first approach, but it's not that easy to know where to start or how to do that. So I'd love your advice on, on how someone in my position is able to do that, what your, what your approach would be. And you also mentioned that you're interested in having that conversation. Would love to be a part of it if it does happen. Thank you. Great. Um, yes, is that Nick? Cooper, I think. Hard to see. Richard Cooper, Harvard. Uh, one of the speakers, maybe two, mentioned anonymity. Could we do something about that? The highways, as Erlanger calls them, don't admit anyone on them without a name. Now, of course, one can give fake names, but you could make that illegal and therefore chargeable. So can we elim eliminate anonymity in these social media? Thank you. Um, if there's one more, fine. And, and then we'll go back to the panel. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, thank you very much. 
Dania Khatib, I want to ask, we have been speaking here about fake news, about who's responsible for that, how to correct them. My question is very simple. Is it feasible, given the big amount of data that's on social media every day? And now uh, the radicalization is mostly done over the internet, over social media. Is it feasible? Who can do that? Who can do such a big job? Thank you. Yes, I, I think in the end you've asked the hardest question. Um, I think what I'll do, given we've got a little time left, is just go back to the panel and have you respond to whatever has been addressed to you, but um, what makes sense to you, and in the usual way, we'll go in, in reverse order. So, Stefan. Okay. Um, that was a very good question, and of course, um, culture plays a big role, and I even think it's, it's human nature Culture is important, also human nature. Um, we are drawn to things that steer us up emotionally. And actually, fake news that work, if you look at them, at all the fake news that have been really successful, they are very emotional. They, they touch you. I mean, this is, why, um, 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 this is why in Germany, for example, a lot of that is on, on immigrant crime, but then crime against um, vulnerable people, against children, against women, you know, because that's, that steers you up emotionally. And, um, and also the social networks have been, they have been optimized to feed into that attention economy that we have. And, 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 and um, people click on that and therefore it also shows up in your news feed more and it feeds, feeds more into it. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we will have to talk about how we deal with that and how we, how we reverse a process where basically technology takes advantage of some um, issues with our, um, with, with, with our um, nature um, of being drawn into these emotional issues. And the people are saying that we need to th talk about, for example, how um, algorithms um, select your news feed and that, for example, um, the, user, the user of Facebook should get control what kind of news they want to have featured. Do I want to see more of my family, you know, what's happening in the family? Do I want to see more um, diverse uh, kind of news? Uh, the ability to, to really have your own say um, in terms of how you want to, um, how, what kind of news you want to be fed on social media rather than the algorithm just picking up on your natural tendencies. We will have to have these kinds of conversations. Um, I wanted to make one brief comment on, on the regulatory issue because Germany has just um, gone down this road this year and, um, and uh, adopted uh, a law forcing Facebook, uh, Twitter, social media companies to take down illegal speech within 24 hours. And, we, and, and the focus here, you have to understand, is illegal speech. So libel, if you, if you tell lies about a person, something hate, like that. Hate uh, speech. Hate speech. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that needs to be, be taken down. That's illegal speech in Germany. And, and if they don't take, uh, if those social media companies don't take it down within 24 hours, they can be heavily fined. The problem with fake news is or with the fake news that I've been seeing, are political fake news. They wouldn't fall under this kind of law. There's fake news, most fake news in Germany is not illegal and not illegal in most democracies, especially if it's about political stories. We want people to be able to express themselves freely, so I'm very skeptical about regulatory approaches because it starts already with the problem of how you de define fake news that would be illegal and taking it down has huge implications um, for freedom of speech um, uh, censorship. No, that's great. Thank and, uh, you. And I will, I will end yeah, it here. That's good. No, I mean, part of the problem is speed. I mean, 24 hours seems not very short, <laughs> frankly, to take down hate speech and so on. And just to add to the last question, the only way you can do this is with AI. Yeah. Right. It's technology. There's That's no, I mean, there's millions of posts going up. You will need smart technology to right. do this because there's no way that human beings can review all of this. Which is a kind of part of our circular problem. Antina. <laughs> 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 Pour rebondir sur ce que, ce que vient de dire euh, Stéphane, le, je crois qu'il ne faut pas essayer de définir juridiquement la fake news parce que c'est un phénomène tellement euh, diversifié que tenter de définir juridiquement, euh, euh, ça, ça paraît trop compliqué. Euh, il faut au contraire euh, utiliser ce qu'on a 
et contextualiser finalement euh, les, les choses. C'est-à-dire c'est le contexte, c'est le trouble à l'ordre public. On a des notions en droit qui sont suffisamment générales pour pouvoir euh, répondre à ces, à ces spécificités. Et euh, vouloir à tout prix réglementer. Alors on a une sénatrice française qui voulait, a fait une proposition de loi pour euh, adopter une loi sur les fake news. Et euh, au contraire, je pense que c'est, c'est un danger parce qu'il va falloir définir ce que c'est. Or, on l'a vu, il y a une grande diversité de, de ces fake news. Et pour répondre aux différentes questions, je voudrais juste ajouter le, l'idée en fait, de co-régulation. C'est vrai qu'aujourd'hui, là, historiquement, le, le droit des activités numériques, c'est, un droit, c'est de la soft law, c'est un droit qui n'est pas contraignant, qui est essentiellement d'origine privée. Et aujourd'hui, on est plutôt dans une tendance où il va falloir co-réguler entre les acteurs publics et les acteurs privés euh, avec euh, des, euh, des sanctions qui peuvent être juste de la responsabilisation, c'est-à-dire sans son, sanctions euh, dures, mais aussi des sanctions qui commencent à être dures de la part de la Cour de justice de l'Union européenne, de la Commission européenne. Euh, on a des, euh, la Cour européenne des droits de l'homme, on a des jurisprudences européennes qui aujourd'hui s'emparent du problème et apportent de véritables solutions et interprètent les règles existantes au regard de euh, cette actualité. Et je pense que c'est là la meilleure, la meilleure solution. Merci. Ok. Oliver. Yeah, from my perspective, I think with the uh, big amount of fake news, there is no 100% uh, solution out there. So I think even if the governments or regulation try to find, um, uh, put a 24 hours uh, limit on that, there is no 100% coverage because the amount of data, the tools, maybe through the artificial intelligence tools, I think there is a way to close that gap, but I think it will be not there. So the current way how we do um, uh, issuing information, I think, uh, needs a radical change. And I think the gentleman from Harvard is the right one. I think uh, in the future you will see that we, everybody will have a digital identity to do anything kind of business out there. And then we can identify if somebody really uh, be trusted going forward. Which is a nice idea, except in Britain you don't have a national ID card. In America you don't have one. You have data shoots. You have all kinds of But there issues. are certain nations, are already Estonia, other yeah, yeah. countries are now um, ramping up that. So that's something that no, 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 everybody's right. working on. No, 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 it's true. And then, you know, someone once said to me, you know, if you asked an American if they'd be willing to have a chip put in their head so the government could follow them around and um, actually listen to them all the time, they, of course, would say no. But, of course, we all do it voluntarily. Sure, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Susan. So on the general question about just the complexity of the challenge, I think technology has to be a part, regulation has to be a part, education has to be a part. Um, and then we haven't really talked a lot about politics, but just maintaining the kind of liberal democratic fora in which debate can happen, back to the rabbi's point, um, and I, I'm not talking about religion, but I'm just talking about the kind of vigorous debate that helps defend truth. Um, so it's going to be a multifaceted solution. It's not going to be any one. But the point is, again, this allocation of responsibility across different stakeholders. Uh, I also think it's a question of picking our battles. We aren't going to be able to get rid of all fake news or, indeed, all uh, negative consequences of different technologies. The question is, what really matters? Um, And then finally, on this question, there are ways, um, and to the gentleman's point, there are ways to introduce regulation that is manageable, for example, advertising. There's no reason, in my view, why these companies should be able to have one standard for advertising online um, and a far stricter standard for advertising, you know, in the paper version of the New York Times. Um, With respect to Richard's comment on anonymity, it's an important point, and we know from other sites like Yik Yak, which was an anonymous social media site that has been taken down, uh, that the FBI got involved in from time to time. We know that worse things happen on anonymous sites. The problem is that the perpetrators on anonymous sites are very hard to find, and the resources required to do so are um, disproportionate in many cases. Um, And the harm is already done. And indeed, that's a big problem with this point I made earlier about the law lagging behind technology, which is by the time the law gets around to doing anything, Uh, it's too late and the harm is done. Um, And then finally, the question on AI. Um, I'd be happy to take it offline in more detail. Um, You should have a look at a a network that's forming with companies like Salesforce and Microsoft. But the fundamental question for startups is from the very beginning to ask, what, what is the real good we're doing with this technology and where might there be risk? 
and where there's risk, what might, might we do to mitigate that risk? And, um, and in your case, look at others. Look at DeepMind, look at the other companies that are out there and see um, what their thinking is and how their thinking on these issues um, might be relevant to yours. But I'm happy to take it offline. Great. Um, and then to conclude, I just wanted to make one comment since we're talking about fake news and my president keeps attacking my newspaper and others for fake news. Um, the one thing you have to understand about President Trump is he actually adores the New York Times. He has a very intimate love-hate relationship with the New York Times. He grew up with the New York Times. He, from New York, he grew up in Queens. The New York Times to him was Manhattan. It, it was the elite, it was glamour. He actually wants our love as much as he dislikes us. Um, and of course, when he calls us fake news, clearly what he's trying to do, he's using us as, as uh, puppets in his play that he's creating. But he's simply trying to make sure that when we actually do real news, which we tend to do, that particularly touches him and his administration, he can undermine its credibility by calling it all fake. Now, how you control the President of the United States is beyond me. But I do want to ask you to join me in thanking the panel for what is a great discussion, and of which was on time also. Thank you. Jerry.